Hello friends, how are you? I'm Ari Therger and today I'm going to talk about terms for magic workers in Nordic paganism. In the terms that were given to label someone who practiced a specific type of magic work. We have all heard terms such as Seidkona or Spokona, Seidermadr, etc. But there are certain terms not often used or seldom referred to in the academic field and I would like you to know those terms as well because once in a while you might find them and it's important to understand uh, the meaning of the terms so that you understand the entire context. The old Norse poems and Icelandic sagas are filled <laughs> with wizards, sorcerers, prophets and so on. So let me give you a couple of terms, some examples and names that you might hear or read when searching for the lore or academic material concerning the Northern European traditional ways of magic, rune casting, witchcraft and such. In this way you will get used to those names and you won't be lost when you encounter them along your studies. Europeans have always been people really close to the magic arts. This may sound like some fanciful idea taken out of a fantasy book, but when I mean magic, I am referring to those who practiced some form of shamanism or any other form of tribal spirituality, a divination or those who worked with herbs and drugs in terms of healing the body or to induce trance and of course sorcery and folk magic. I'm not going to say the terms in an alphabetical order, I go as I, re I remember, so you may want to get your notebooks, uh, they might come in handy when we talk about uh, strange terms. Right. The first word one might hear or read a lot when searching for the Norse lore and people who practiced such magical arts is the word Fulfla. The name given to a prophetess or the general term for witch. Uh, there are many women referred to in this way in the lore, uh, in the sagas, especially the Voduspo. Another word not so much heard of is Thul the title used for a wise man, a sage or a bard, a person with the gift of singing and with the gift of words, the power of speech, a very eloquent person who uses those gifts to tell or sing stories uh, with morality and warnings and wisdom and also a person who describes the lineage of kings and heroes having great knowledge in the matter. The word seidr <laughs> is a very common word used to describe a particular set of magical work closer to a shamanic type of spiritual work. Let's say in a very broad sense it's the traditional shamanism of the northern peoples of Europe and in this field women were the ones who practiced it most often. Such women were either called seidkona or spokona which is the origins of the Scottish Spiewife, a prophetess, a foreteller. There were also men who practiced it, but since Seidr was closely associated with women and the female gender in later times, with the introduction of Christianity and the rooting of Christian religious ideas in the Scandinavian society, the male role in Seidr was put aside due to new religious morality and so men who were cocked practicing it could be outraged, insulted, reviled and even sentenced to death in some cases. But these men were called Seidr Mathra or Spol Mathra, the same thing as a Spinan, a seer. Spo is to predict and spodum is divination, the art of foretelling the future, which is also used as a general synonym for trolldom. Please 
watch my previous video about Trolldom and you will understand this term. The word spa survived in the Scottish term spiewife, a fortune-telling woman. This is also intimately tied with the term offered spodum, oppressive divination, which is the act of predicting, predicting or foretelling harmful events in the future. There is also a title for a wizard, those famous men filled with wisdom and knowledge in the magic arts. The title often used is Vitki, although this is also the same term to refer to people who work with the runes, mainly divinatory work through the runes. For those who read runes and are the rune masters, the title is Runa Mestri, and also Galdra Mestri or Galdra Kona for a man or a woman who uses spells. There are also those who deal with the black arts, which are often called wrongly Fjölkuning. This error often comes in academic works. The term is Fjölkunigra, possessed of magical knowledge, derived from Fjölkingi, much knowledge, magic, knowledge of magical arts. Occasionally, Fjolkingi is also referred to as Frodelekra, to play with wisdom, to play with learning. Fjolkuni Connor, wise women or women practitioners of magic or magical arts, and Fjolkuni Gnadra for men. There are those who work with mysterious and sinister spirits and white, who were often called Theorieling. However, this term is not often used nor often seen in the lore. Trollathig, troll like, which is a person whose behavior is associated with possessing knowledge in Trolldom. It's a person who practices Trolldom and therefore is Trollhuning, which means troll skilled, a person who is skilled in magic one who is knowledgeable in Trolldom. As I've said, my previous video explaining what Trolldom is might help you to understand all these terms referring to Troll, which was not um, a creature living underneath bridges or in mountains that came before, uh, during late medieval and modern Scandinavia, mistaking entities, possessors of magic with the Jotnar but more of that on the previous video. Someone gifted with insight into the future was called Fronsin. A shapeshifter was called Hamramr. And Hamfarir was to travel in an assumed shape, a power possessed by wizards, a type of shapeshifting. A second sighted person was called Orsik. Uh, in the sense of being able to see things going on in the spiritual world, which are usually hidden from ordinary mo mortals. Hog, Hög, or Hag in English, it's a witch who rides people or animals at night. However, it can also refer to the desire and mind of a person when practicing Trolldom. To use one's mind to change another person's mind is referred to the act of Urgvenda. A person with superhuman strength was Raubahin, possessed of more than mortal strength. You might find quite often that the general term for magic in Old Norse, or the term referring to Norse magic, is Gand or Gandra a term associated with magic workers, magical beings linked to the person who practices magic, and also objects used for magic. But in fact, in the literary sources, the most used term for magic in general, the magical arts, is Fjolkingi. Although the previous term is also used, but not that often because it's usually referring to specific magical works associated with Seidra. The word for spell or song 
is Galdra. This word may also be referring to items, objects used to practice magic, since people had to use them to chant a spell. And this term is also used in such matter because spells were sung in a high voice, very much verbal. Galdr used to be an art within Seidr itself until it was detached from it uh, due to the gender social stigmas and began to be an art apart from other magical works. Galdr or Galdur became more honorable and the Seidr form more widely considered shameful or womanish. But in reality, there seems to have been originally only certain technical distinctions between the two. So these are a few terms you might encounter when studying the Norse lore and the old ways of Nordic spirituality. These are terms you may find in Old Norse literary sources and also in late medieval and modern Scandinavia, since folk magic was still being practiced and in many court accounts of witch hunts and trials, witch trials of modern Scandinavia, you will find many of these terms, especially the ones related with troll doom or any term with the troll word in it. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video and you might be wondering why I move my hands so much in my videos. I'm not Italian, but the thing is, I have a couple of death subscribers or hard of hearing and I really want them to understand me and uh, since my my native language isn't English I have to translate my thoughts into English and then the process of translating the translation into sign language which I'm not very knowledgeable in is very difficult and I am only human after all so I try to move my body and my hands a lot so that my body language might be might be easier for certain people to follow the speech and the subject of my video through my body language. But also, I'll take the opportunity to tell you that um, probably you should um, turn on the subtitles because I spend an awful lot of time writing the subtitles in English. So that may be another way for you to easily follow the subjects of my videos with the subtitles I write. So, once again, thank you so much for watching. Uh, see you on the next video. And as always, da <laughs>